You know, Christmas can be an incredibly exciting time. I like to be part of life experiences where there's energy, there's enthusiasm, there's excitement, there's an aliveness. I think that that's why a lot of people are attracted maybe to athletic and sporting events. Do we have any uh, Spartan fans here? Any Spartan fans? Yeah. Okay. Tom Izzo would be glad to hear that. Okay. The Breslin Center and you've got the Spartans, you know, are going to a bowl game. How, do we have any Michigan Wolverine fans here? Yeah. This is the first time it's kind of equal. Usually the big house has a little bit more of enthusiasm there. There's something about that big event that happened in the big house, Guinness World Book of Records, largest outdoor hockey game that's ever happened. So you've got MSU, you've got the University of Michigan, and then there's another kind of energy that can be produced sometimes when you just kind of do something like crazy and wacko and nuts, you know what I mean? How many of you like to go tubing behind a boat? You like to go tubing behind a boat? Yeah. Do you know what I enjoy more than tubing behind a boat? Driving the boat. You know why? Because I get to inflict pain on teenagers. Teenagers who have cocky attitudes who say, I bet you can't whip me off. And I'm thinking, wait a second. I'm going 37 miles per hour. When I crack the whip, I'm going to elongate your armpits right now, all right? I'm going to inflict some pain on you. Or how about snow tubing? I love to go snow tubing and, you know, like, you know, big old inner tubes are pumped up and three, four people get on them. And just when they're getting ready to crest over, I like to jump on. People start bouncing off. Hats fly off. Glasses fly off. Plus, it's like a garage sale going down the hill. You can have crazy experiences like that or there's sporting events, but there's also an energy that comes when people assist and help other people. When people make a difference. Just a few weeks ago, we had a group of people from this church, the river, go down to a street in Pontiac. It's called Seneca Street. Seneca, uh, Seneca Street was a dilapidated street. And Grace Centers of Hope basically purchased up the homes on it and said, we're going to revent, renovate those, we're going to refurbish those, we're going to bring some dignity to this neighborhood. And we had a bunch of people go down and put up Christmas lights and nativities, and in that there was an energy. And you know, there's also an energy when the presence of God is in a place. A few weeks ago at our church right here, we were talking about the reality that God speaks to people, that God whispers. That God will direct us. And literally on a daily basis, we're hearing about people saying, I am actually for the first time in my life hearing the whispers of God. We want you tonight to appreciate the fact that the baby of Bethlehem is uncontainable. Now I want to talk to some of you who are coming in here and you're not feeling that enthusiasm and you're not feeling that energy or maybe that vibe. Maybe you came today and you're feeling defeated, you're feeling lonely, you're overwhelmed, you're broken, and you may even be saying, is life worth living? Maybe you're over your head. I believe that God divinely brought you here on this night. Some of you may have come and you only came because this was your ticket for a gift for another party or something like that. No. God wanted each one of us to be here tonight. God wants you to experience his verve. What do I mean by that? We've already alluded to it. It's the enthusiasm. It's the energy. The, it's aliveness. It's the spark of life. And I want to illustrate the verve of God with several words. And the first word, we've already alluded to it. It's power. It's power. You know, uh, Betsy's going to be up here assisting us, and there's a celestial, heavenly power. When God announced that he was going to come to earth, notice how he did it. He didn't go to the elite people of society. He went to the common man. He went to the shepherd. There was a celestial being. It says in the scriptures that the heavens will declare the glory of God. The heavens will declare the power of God. You know, power can be presented in multiple ways, and a lot of times there's contracts. Uh, I, I found this quite interesting on a PBS special, that the Queen of England, when she comes in, there's a lot of power. What people may not know is this, is she comes in with 4,000 pounds.
pounds of luggage. She comes in with two outfits for every occasion, and then also brings in a mourning outfit in the event that somebody should die. She brings 40 pipes of plasma, white leather toilet seat covers, her own hairdresser, two valets, bodyguards, and an entourage of attendants. It can cost upwards of $20 million to bring in the queen. I'm not saying that's bad, good, it's power. Contrast that, though, with a lady who lived on the other side of the world from that by the name of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was given a limousine one time, never drove it, never sat in it, immediately sold it, and used the money to provide dignity for people who had le leprosy. Power. The Bible talks about power when it talks about the power and the celestial being of God. Isaiah 9, 6 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called W.C., Wonderful Counselor, M.G., Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. I love this verse. You know why? Because it's not just something that we did uh, with typo. The fact is, is he's Mighty God, capital G, not small G, big G. Not just a good guy, but God. He's not a wimp. No, he's capable, he's strong, he's powerful. In fact, the book of Colossians tells us that that God, Jesus, who came as a baby, already existed, and in his pre-existence before he came, he was part of creation. He had his, just like Betsy has her handiwork right now on this painting, he had his handiwork on creation. He was the one, God himself, who is all-powerful, who divided the Red Sea. Sorry to pop anybody's bubble on this one, but it wasn't Charlton Heston playing Moses that did it. No, there was a real guy by the name of Moses who was connected with a holy, powerful God who, in fact, parted the Red Sea. It says in the Bible that God, that's power, could shut the mouths of lions. Not only that, when the children of Israel were going up against their enemies, they wanted to bring in uh, thousands and thousands to go against thousands. And God said, no, give me 300 of your finest men. 300 of the finest will defeat thousands of the enemy. Why? The power of God. He walked on water, he calmed the water. He raised the dead, and he rose from the dead. God is a God of miracles. He gives sight to the blind. He caused the lame to walk. And you know what else? He's still doing it today. A woman came up to me a couple weeks ago and she said this. She said, Terry, I'm feeling the power of God. She said, I am emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically healed. I may have physical pains, but I'm a different person. Why? Because of the power of God. Think about the power. When you talk about the power of God, our entire calendar system is based upon the life of Jesus Christ. He came as the expected king. People still today reject him, and to some he's the rejected king. But there will be a day when everyone will acknowledge that he's the accepted king. I've had a couple of occasions in my life where uh, they've been life and death situations. When I was back in Chicago years ago, I was with a friend, and because of the ministry that he was involved in, there were death threats put on him and his ministry quite often. And I remember I was driving in a van with him, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, man, I forgot. He goes, are you scared to die? I go, scared to die? What are you talking about? He goes, are you scared to die? I go, do you? I'm scared to die. I'm not scared to die. I'm ready to die, but what are you talking about? He goes, I forgot all about it when I was walking out. I got a message that... They said there was a bomb threat on this van, and I forgot to check. I said, are you kidding me? But you know what? There was no fear. The power of God was with us. If you want to experience the verve of God, then you and I need to begin to connect with the power of God. It's the first word. The second word is this, love. When I think of God, I think of love. 
Psalm 136.1 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The Bible has such a tapestry of the love affair that He has with His people, that He has with you and me. And that is exemplified in a passage of Scripture that ties in totally unequivocally with the Christmas story. It's found in Luke 2, 10 through 11. And it says, And before Betsy was painting that angel, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. You know what the greatest inhibitor is to faith today? Fear. What will people say? What will people think? Uh, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that because there's things that I don't know. Do you not think that Mary, and now, right now, Betsy's painting Joseph, that the two of them, wasn't there fear? They, it wasn't all bad out. He goes on to say, don't be afraid. I bring you not mediocre news, not half-baked news. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, there's a Savior. He's been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. If you really look at this verse, do you know what this is? This is like love on steroids. You go, where do you get that from? Savior, do you realize that I'm forgiven? Do you realize that you and I don't have to carry around the guilt, the grief, the garbage, we can get rid of the backpack that is weighing us down. In the New Testament, I already said that it's a tapestry in the Bible. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. On a weekly basis, we have people coming up and saying, I've never understood the power and the love of God before like this. I want Christ to come into my life I believe. Mary, can you imagine what she was feeling when she realized that literally she was going to be the one to bear the Christ child? Why me? Could this be happening? There had to be fear. But I love what she says. In Luke it says, I am the Lord's servant. And I'm willing to do whatever you ask. A gentleman came up to me not too long ago, and he said, Terry, I'm learning more about God. I'm learning more about what God wants to be in my life and how I want him to be in my life because I'm responding to his love. He goes, I've I, I, I got to admit to you that there have been times that God has spoken and I haven't obeyed. I don't want that to happen anymore. Can we get together? Can we get together? so that we can work this through, so I can work this through. He had the heart of Mary. You see, when an individual responds to the power and the love of God, life changes. It really changes.
that the verb and the energy of God and the, the power and the love of God comes really in a raucous, rambunctious, big C approach. But the verve of God, a lot of times, the power and the love of God comes in a setting like we just experienced. There can also be a peace and a calm to the verve and the energy and the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm and the excitement of God. If you and I are going to experience the verve of God, which means the energy and the enthusiasm and the life and the spark of God in our own lives, then we tap into the power of God, the love of God, and the third word that I'd like to leave with you is life. Life. A lot of people kind of almost disregard in a lot of ways throughout their life the life of Christ, but the, the life of Christ and who he is is not just a kind of like an apostrophe. It's like a major exclamation point. He came that we might have life. John 10.10 10 in the NIV Bible says this, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The NLV version says this, My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God had a purpose to give us a purpose that's why he came. The Message Bible amplifies it even more when it says this. I come so that they can have a real life, yes, here on earth, but also the future life in heaven, an eternal life, more and a better life than they ever dreamed of. You see, when I said that I believe, we believe that this experience tonight can change your life, that just wasn't hyperbole. That just wasn't rhetoric. That wasn't just something to say. We actually believe it because of what Christ, Christmas is and who Christ is. The verb. God wants you to live an uncontainable life. He wants you to live a verb life. Not to be corny. He wants you to be vervy. He wants you to be vervy. Let me illustrate it in this way. Let me, let me share this story. I believe that this story is going to illustrate the fact that the power of God comes sometimes when we don't expect it. That the very love of God comes and he accepts us unconditionally where we are, regardless of where we've been, regardless of where we're going, regardless of even the way we think about God. And that God, at any time, if he's knocking at the door and we open it, we can have life. Before, before I was involved with the river and before we started the river, I was traveling around the country speaking to major youth conferences, to sporting teams, uh, middle school, high school assemblies, that kind of thing. And it would be nothing to do 22 to 24 assemblies uh, in a given, I mean, uh, speaking engagements in a month. That, that was pretty much the norm. And then with some consulting with youth ministries and that sort of thing. And it was a great wave a while, while it went. It was, it, it was a great ride. It truly was. But one of the things that got pretty uh, uh, tiring about that was just the travel, the travel, the travel. And what, you really, what I really wanted to do most of the time was, the quick, after I was done with an engagement, get me home so I could be with my family. And at this time, so I could be with my wife. Well, I was one on one of those trips that I had to take one plane to another plane, and I was finally on the last leg. I got on my plane, I'm walking down the aisle, and I look in the row where I'm at, I just went, oh, cha-ching, thank you, God, nobody's in that row. Man, I put my stuff in the overhead bin, put my briefcase under, grabbed the pillow, grabbed the, grabbed the blankie, and it was like, ooh, I'm going down for a long winter's night. I was just starting to fall asleep, and I feel a tap on my shoulder, and I thought, what flight attendant would tap me right now. I have my seatbelt on and I look up and there's an elderly woman looking at me. She goes, I think this is my seat. And in my head I'm going, do I look like a flight attendant here? I am not in a good mood at all. She goes, but could you help me get seated? And I'm going, okay, sure, sure, no question. So I helped her with her luggage and stuff. She sat down in the seat. I gave her her seatbelt, greeted her, grabbed my pillow again, grabbed my blanket. Man, I'm cuddling up like this. And she taps me, and she begins to talk and ask me questions. She was a talker. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, no way, not tonight, not a talker. But she goes, just like this, she goes, what do you do? 
Now, normally in that situation, when someone said, what do you do? I'd say, hey, I'm an inspirational speaker, travel around the country, do high school, middle school, and I'm not, I'm not just going to blast Jesus on them. Because eventually they're going to ask me, what do you do? But let me tell you, I was already tired, I was annoyed, she was a talker, and she was in my crosshairs. She goes, what do you do? I said, I talk to young people about uh, the fact that they can have respect for themselves, respect for others, and they can have respect for God, and I talk to them about their relationship with Jesus Christ. She goes, you're kidding me, that's so dark. You have calm down. All right, the whole plane doesn't need to know. You didn't know a seven-year-old woman could talk that loud. And then all of a sudden, she got serious, and she put both of her hands and her arms on the armrest. She was from England. Her name was Gladys, and she said this. She said, you know, Dr. Billy Graham was just in our country, and I went to a crusade one night. I heard him speak, and the love of God just came all over me. And Dr. Billy Graham, you know, at the end, when he speaks, he asks people to respond and respond to the love of God and to the power of God. And when he gave that invitation, I went to stand up, and my husband pulled me down. She said, I regret that day. Now I'm feeling the verve. And I went like this. I said, Gladys, would you like to accept Jesus Christ tonight? And she said, I can accept Jesus tonight. God would give me a second chance. And I said, absolutely. He would love to give you a second chance. I'm now holding hands with a 70-year-old woman. And Gladys went just like this and said, Dear Lord Jesus, tonight, thank you for giving me a second chance. Please come into my life. For the rest of my life, I want to live for you. I love you. In Jesus' name. I am now losing it. I'm crying. Not long after that, I heard from Gladys' daughter, and she said, just thank you for being open and being available to talk to my mom. She's a different person. And I'm thinking, you don't really know me because I wasn't really that available at the beginning at all. And then a package came to our house. And it was from England. And in it was this blanket that those arthritic little fingers cross-stitched, all that, and she wanted us to have this for our first time. This, this blanket here has literally been on every one of our children's cribs. And I'm going to admit something to you that I think most fathers have done, but most guys don't talk about it. There would be times that I would sneak into my kids' bedroom when they were little, and I'd pick them up and I'd hug them. And I'd look at that blanket and I'd cuddle my firstborn son, Trevor, and there were times that I'd just go like this and I'd say, dear God, would you please give me the ability to be the dad that I need to be for him? And then I'd pray and I'd say, dear Jesus, may, may he come to know you. You know, blankets, and children have a way of really changing life. Take a look at this family. I was 16.